Hello, welcome to the Foundations Conversations at Home program. I'm Michael Adato from the Sydney Morning Herald and the Melbourne Age. Before we speak to our guests today, I want to let you know that the Foundation has set up a COVID relief fund in order to support thousands of union performers who are going through tough times. Since March, thanks to your donations, the Foundation has given over $6.3 million in emergency aid to more than 6,800 performers and their families. If you are a SAG AFTRA member and you need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. All the information you need can be found in the description of this video. Thank you for your support. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Emma Booth and Ewan Leslie from The Gloaming. Ewan, Emma, hello, and great to speak to you. Hi. Hi. Great to be here. Maybe just some geographical housekeeping. I'm obviously in Los Angeles. Um, if you guys want to just tell us where you're dialing in from, so we get a sense of this is a this is a, a glow. This isn't just a conversation that spans the American states. It's also a conversation that spans the planet. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm um, I'm dialing in from Sydney, Australia. It is nine a.m. in the morning. Uh, I got both my kids into daycare, and I have made it here. I'm really kicking off. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yay. Um, I'm in Florida, so I'm at 6 p.m. So, yeah, we're all very far away from each other. So the gloaming is um, a, a very challenging and very interesting piece of work. It was created by screenwriter Victoria Madden. I'm going to call it just at first flush a, uh, a police procedural that kind of has a has a kind of a, a sort of a, a cloak of, I love the phrase, subcutaneous horror to it. There's something mm. quite settling in it. Maybe just to get into that, if you can take us into your first conversations um, with Victoria when you met her, how the project was introduced to you and why, to take it from the actor's perspective, how you balance the two things which I think end up inevitably on the table, which are how can I serve this piece of work and how can this piece of work serve me artistically yeah well um me personally uh, vicky brought it to me she brought me the script and um i absolutely loved it i was like this is so my thing i love supernatural um i love crime drama it's i was like wow marrying the two um i was very excited she saw a film of mine how love loved it um i was like this is my girl and then uh it went away for a while for me and then it came back. I think they were going out to other people, even though Vicky was very, very keen on having me. Um, and so, yeah, it came back. I did the auditions and, um, yeah, got the role and was absolutely ecstatic, especially because, you know, being Tasmania as well, I was so excited um, to go and shoot there because I really wanted to go there. And I adored the Kettering incident. I thought that was absolutely beautiful and I love her work. So, um yeah, next thing I knew, I was in Tasmania freezing. Ewan? Um, I, uh, like Emma, I'd, I'd auditioned for it. Uh, I saw, I'd seen the Kettering incident, which I really loved. And even though you could sort of make uh, parallels to other shows, uh, it was very much its own beast. And... Um, Look, I, I, I'd grown up, as when I was growing up, I was a big fan of um, genre stuff. You know, I, I loved horror films and I loved action films and thrillers, but I was a big fan of sort of, um, you know, suspenseful horror films. And it was, I'd never really done something that was so genre based before. A lot of the stuff I'd been doing had been sort of, you know, dramas and or melodramas. And so I kind of knew that because I'd seen the Kettering incident, even though it was a procedural police show and, you know, very much in this sort of, uh, you know, Scandi noir mold, I knew that it would be something that was, was out of the box. Um, the other thing is that at that point, I knew that uh, by the time they came to me and said that there was interest, I knew that the other person they were thinking about was Emma who um, I'd been a big fan of for a long time. I'd seen her in Hounds of Love and thought she was extraordinary. And um, yeah, it just seemed like a great group of people coming together to do something that I hadn't, hadn't really done before. Mm -hmm. um, the very best, I think, TV show titles are transportative titles. They are titles that take you to a place that works for everything from Desperate Housewives to Gilligan's Island. You kind of say it 
and I know, you know, you say Gilligan's Island, I know where I am suddenly. Um, the gloaming is a Scottish word that refers to the twilight, but I think broadly and very specifically here now, it also implies something otherworldly about the twilight. It's kind of the twilight as a place that's very much unto itself. What What is your sense of what that title means and where did it take you in this particular case? Well, for me, it's um, it's also the place between, you know, life and death. Mm. And that's where these, you know, these spirits are stuck, but also the characters. Each character um, in the gloaming is really stuck in grief and they can't move forward and they can't move back. And so they kind of they're just in this in-between space. So it means so many different things. And I think once you see the show, um, you get a better meaning of that. But um, it's also my favourite time of the day, the gloaming. I'm like, oh, it's the magic hour. So um, I thought the title was absolutely brilliant, actually. When I first saw it, I was like, wow, that fits. But, yeah. You would? Um, that was a really good answer. But, I, yeah, I, I think... Uh, I agree in the sense that, you know, the gloaming is obviously the time between night and day. And then there's this uh, place between life and death uh, where these characters uh, called gloamers exist that have sort of unfinished business. But I love what Emma was just saying about these people who are caught in this, uh, this uh, place of grief where they can't move forward, they can't go backward. And I think that's what um, I really responded to when I read it was that you know, I think a lot of the time with these, uh, not to go too much, on, too much on a tangent, but a lot of the time with these sort of, you know, procedural shows or, uh, you know, um, crime mysteries that the case and the mystery and what's happening at the centre of the plot is kind of a MacGuffin, you know. It's obviously what's driving the story, but ultimately it's a, it's a character um, drama and I think it's a sort of, exploration of this relationship that's at the centre of these two people who are, who are broken, who, obvious, who hopefully over the course of the eight hours can, um, you know, heal themselves and, and heal each other. Um, just to get into the characters before we get into the show, um, uh, Emma, Molly is kind of described to us as unorthodox and troubled. And I think, I think sometimes, you know, in, in history, those can be code words which kind of risk characterising a woman. How, when you come to her as a as a, a piece of art, as something to interpret, what what is the conversation that you have um, with Vicky Madden? And then how much freedom do you have to kind of go away and kind of find the characteristics that you want to put into her rather than have even the script or somebody else speak for her in a way? Ultimately, you are her. You have to, you have to kind of find a voice that represents her. Yeah. Um, look, she is a troubled character. I mean, she um, she's the kind of character who experienced a lot of trauma, a lot of abandonment. And so that's kind of really stuck with her and, and she, it's hard for her to let people in, you know, yet she's the most sensitive person in the room and she's, but she's impulsive and she's a risk taker and, um, you know, an absolutely brilliant detective. She's kind of, she's a bit of a genius. She's got this insane memory where she can walk into a room and remember every single little detail. And that's something that she's kind of enhanced and um, taught herself from a, a game that her father had taught her. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was really interesting. I think Vicky had, um, I think she was very inspired by the killing. So it's Sarah Lund, I think. Mm -hmm. was a character so she was really like referring me to her um you know so obviously you know I have to make it my own but um she was like look I'm really inspired by this and I was like oh I love the killing it's one of my favorite shows um and so I had to kind of take this information and her backstory and really kind of just find my own experiences um times where I've felt this and I've felt that and I've, you know, blah, 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 and inject it into these facts and then, yeah, bring, bring that to life. And it's sometimes difficult when, especially when you're doing a police procedural on top of that because <laughs> it's like then you've got, you know, all the nomenclature, you've got, yeah, the, the police lingo, lingo that, that goes with that and you're like, how do I say this with, you know, 
looking really kind of authentic. I mean, I picked the brains of this detective that I'd met, but it was kind of like incorporating all of that, marrying all that together and, um, and being convincing in all of it and having this kind of, you know, this drama, this thread of this drama through the whole thing as well. It was hard. Can I just tell you? I was scared. <laughs> I, was there, I remember like just before we started, I was like, oh, my God, what am I doing? I mean, I know what I'm doing, but I, I have no idea what I'm doing. It's one of those things where, you know, it, it's it, actually that's, <clears throat> excuse me, really interesting because I stayed with Helen Miriam um, for a little while when I was in Los Angeles because I was shooting a film with her husband and she said the same thing to me. She goes, you know, I'm, I'm terrified. Every time before I walk on a set, I'm like, what's my process? What am I doing? I have no, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but then you kind of get there. And especially once you put the costume on and you kind of just like, you know, you sink into the character, it just sort of comes then. Do you know what I mean? It just, it just happens. But it's, um, yeah, for me, <laughs> for me, Molly and I've played robots, zombies, goddesses, serial killers. I mean, I could just keep going on. Molly was one of the hardest characters I've had to play because I had to keep it really grounded and really real. At the same time, there's ghosts kind of in the background and, you know, so it was, it was tough. But I think, I think we got there even when you're like, ah, oh, what am I doing? I mean, I get that every job anyway. Um, it kind of happens. The magic happens, especially when you've got brilliant people like you and to work with. I was so happy when I knew it was him, especially because he's he's such a great guy. You're so nice, you oh, so uh, and so talented. Um, so it was a great team. You know, you know when you've got a good team, it's like okay, you can trust it, everyone, and you can just create magic. So yeah, you and um, Alex, uh, uh, you know. Uh, as, as outsiders, I mean, we the media is a layer of filtration and in some respects so is the marketing. And I think both of those entities uh, tend to lean into tropes. So I think from the outsider's perspective coming to this when you know very little, the first thing, the first note that's kind of handed to us about Alex is that he's a sort of a mysterious, he's like a, he plays to the man of mystery trope. He's a kind of a guy with some uncertainty around him. As yeah. an actor, I mean, get to get into him um, uh, for us now. As an actor, those those marketing lines and those kind of those kinds of tropes that kind of crop up, they obviously don't. They're not something that happens in the mind of an actor. Your discipline is something yeah. else entirely. Um, who, who is he to you when when he's on the page? Like, what's what what are the what become the, the defining characteristics that you need to find to work in him day to day? I guess, I, I mean, that's a really good question because so much of the time, you know, I mean, I've, I've played all sorts of people like Emma have, has and I've played some really awful people as well. And a lot of the time, like, I mean, you, you, your greatest strength as an actor, I think, is empathy. So you're constantly trying to find your way into these people. And I suppose the way into Alex that Vicky spoke about um, very early on was, um, was PTSD, was this sort of trauma that he'd gone through as a young man where he was involved in this uh, horrific murder that he was present for. And so not only was he dealing with the PTSD of that, but also the survivor's guilt from that. And he immediately left Tasmania and abandoned Molly. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, I don't think it's something that he ever really dealt with. So that was sort of the road into him, that he was sort of thrust back into this place where you know, Vicky kind of said, like, the second he lands in Tasmania, it's like the spirits start uh, closing in on him. And there's obviously the, you know, the actual ghosts that, that are haunting him in the show that we, we see. But there's also, you know, the, the ghosts of the past, that this grief that Emma was talking about that's sort of lingering. And um, that, that, that was sort of the way into it, was, was PTSD and someone who likes to very much be in control and... You know, I mean, I think Emma and I both had the similar challenges in that you're playing characters who are very closed off, who hold their cards very close. And you're kind of trying to balance that with a vulnerability that they both have as well. So a lot of the time you're sort of walking this thin line between 
you know, being very closed off and not wanting to give away too much and then finding the moments where you do give away or, uh, you know, um, you do kind of crack open and give vulnerability. And I think Emma and I, you know, spend a lot of the time trying to walk that line and find that balance. And there'd be scenes where you'd go, oh man, I think I gave away too much there or other scenes where you'd go, oh man, am I just being completely closed off to the audience? And, you know, I, th I think we were really lucky as, as well that Vicky had charted this great journey for the two characters in terms of the relationship. And as it went along and it, it revealed itself more, she, she had done a lot of the, a lot of the work for us, but, but you're completely right. You can't go into this going, yeah, I think I'll just play him mysterious, you know? So uh, <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, I think you know, this past sort of trauma that, and grief that these characters had was, was definitely the, uh, the road into it. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you both, um, uh, just to kind of jump on a couple of things that, that are in your credits. Once Upon a Time, Emma, was very, very much authored by um, Eddie Kitsis and Adam Horowitz. Mm -hmm. and when Top of the Lake was very clearly Jane Campion's, The Cry was really clearly Jacqueline Persky's. Um, I guess what I want to ask you is, as actors, um, when you are dealing with a really specifically authored piece um, and you're potentially already dealing with a director who has a very singular and specific vision for a piece, you also have to contend with a screenwriter in, in cases where a project is really clearly authored. Where as actors do you find the space to stretch and to play while still respecting the fact that the writer sometimes holds very firm to the written word and that the director has really, really clear ideas about how it needs to be framed and how it needs to be told? Where, is, where, is your, where does your space live generally and, and specifically for the gloaming? Um. That's a, yeah, that's a really good question. Look, um, I think Vicky did have a, you know, she, I mean, she's such a phenomenal writer and her vision is so strong and she knows what she wants, uh, complete genius. And so I trusted her so much going into this, but, she, you know, she does, she did have this vision for it. And it was really interesting to watch the directors, um, you know, kind of really understand that and go, okay, we understand this is your show, you know, Vicky, this is your baby. So you have to kind of work with that. And as an actor, it's the same thing, you know what I mean? It's like, all right, give me what you got. What do you want? And then I can try and work with that. And that's something I've always been really, um, really good at to kind of like, you know, I kind of mould myself around what, um, these people, these artists with their visions have as well. Do you know what I mean? I'm not like, well, oh, this is how I'm doing it and you can just deal with it. I've seen actors like that and it creates a lot of problems. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's like, we're, you know, it's, it's about teamwork and um, I want them to be happy with what I'm doing and I really want, I want to be feeling the magic on the day so you find a way to be like, all right, let's find a happy medium or I really love that or, hey, I've got some ideas here. How would you feel? Do you know what I mean? And Vicky was fantastic with, you know, if, if you came out with ideas or this or that, she was, she was really open to it. But, um, you know, we definitely, um, in, in a way, not in a bad way, kind of really stuck to the vision that she had. And, and thank God because, you know, I think the gloaming's great. I mean... <laughs> I'm a creepy person though. I love creepy things. So, um, and I think Tasmania is visually, you know, stunning. And uh, I was actually saying it in interviews before. It's, it's interesting. Obviously there's been some fantastic shows made in um, Tasmania and the Kettering incident, um, which was absolutely beautiful, but I don't think it's ever been, Tasmania as a whole has never been shot like it has um, in the gloaming because it is one of the main, it is a main character and there's so much to see there. It's breathtaking and it's otherworldly and just rugged and prehistoric and it's like we wanted to capture that and so that's why, you know, um, DRP did such a phenomenal job at just getting these shots, uh, you know, and I'm getting messages already from people and people that have seen me like, I've never seen a place like this. And so it's really interesting. She had this vision. She knew how she wanted Tasmania, you know, 
wanted the world to see Tasmania and this, this show of hers. Um, and we just kind of worked with her. And um, you got to dance. Mm-hmm. you got to dance with people. You want, do you want to talk to that, to, to, the, to where you find the spaces to, to play and to stretch as an actor when you've got a very clearly authored director's work and a, and a really clearly authored piece of writing? Of course. I mean, I think, um, I mean, the three examples that you use for me in terms of Top of the Lake, The Cry, and then this, like, you're right, they're very three very clear. Mm. I mean, doing Top of the Lake, there's never any sort of doubt that you go, oh, I'm in a Jane Campion show, mm. you know, mm. and you'd be sort of having this sort of one-on-one conversation with someone, and then all of a sudden the conversation <laughs> would go from this place that you're like, wow, that's, you know, and at times it feels like quite a leap. Um, and then in something... Like the cry, Jacqueline Persky, it, it feels like an obvious thing to say, but I remember before I did it, a, a friend of mine who was in uh, the, the TV show Love My Way said, you get the, the feeling with Jacqueline's work that um, oh, she's read it all out loud. And I know that sounds like a very obvious thing to say, mm-hmm. but each line constantly feels like, oh, that is exactly what you would say in that scenario. And it feels very carefully constructed and very deliberate. Whereas Vicky, and especially with the gloaming, it feels like so much of, and this sometimes sounds like a bit of a cliche, but in this case, it's very true in that so much of what's going on exists between the lines. So you might read a scene between Emma and I sitting in the car and we're just kind of making a few comments about the case and, you know, do you mind giving me a lift home or whatever, you know, whatever it is. But actually what's really (laughs) going on between the characters exists completely between those uh, those lines. And it means that when a character, you know, let's say Molly, for instance, does come out and does say exactly what she's thinking in that moment, it holds so much more weight because we've watched a whole bunch of scenes of these people holding in maybe what they're really feeling and what they really want to say, but they're unable to. And I, I think the way you navigate that and in terms of as an actor working with such a, I mean, it's kind of about compromise. Emma has a very has a way of working that is wonderful, and I have a way of working, and then the director that comes in has a way of working, and then Vicky has a way of working. Mm. And I think collaboration a lot of the time is compromise. Like, if you come in very rigid going, this is how I do things, and if it doesn't go exactly this way, then I'm, you know, I'm going to be difficult you're not going to get very far. So you constantly, tr- you have to be very malleable, I think, in any scenario in, um, you know, in, in collaborating with others and, and, and creating a, a piece of art. Mm-hmm. One, of the, um, one of the great things I think about watching really old television, so 60s, 70s, 80s television, is the horrific overuse of day for night lenses and, you know, fake rain. And there's a whole bunch of tools that used to exist that kind of cheat a lot of things. Um, Productions moved kind of away from that to a slightly more realistic space. Here you're shooting, uh, for the gloaming, you're shooting in Gordon Dam and in Constitution Dock. Basically, Tasmania looked really cold and really wet and really, really miserable on the screen. And I want to ask you, how how, (laughs) how miserable really was it? And as actors, how served, how much does genuine cold, genuine wet and genuine misery serve you in the moment to play in a way that, you know, 30 years ago they might have said, look, we'll shoot it day for night and we'll, we'll chuck it on a rain machine and you can, you know, you can, be on, you can be in a car in 10 minutes. The truth is there's something much muddier and much more real happening. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, my God, it was freezing. Oh, um, yeah, it wasn't when we first got there. I was like, this isn't so bad. <laughs> Vicky's like, you just wait. It was like, oh, my God. And then the winter kicked in. And, I mean, one of the most ironic things was is that one of the, the coldest locations we had, had was an indoor location. It was the police station. Yes. It was this old building. It was so cold. I'd be wearing that many layers and hot packs all over me. I'm like, this is, you know, those ones that you crack and you shake and you stick them all over your body I don't know if it was maybe it was full of ghosts I'm not sure but I was miserable in there but you know you're like you just get through it but that's a place we had to sort of look warm and I'm like oh, this is freezing and then of course you've got the 3 30 a.m starts a lot of you know those gorgeously juicy 3 a.m three you know wake up calls and drive out to the middle of nowhere 
and there were some locations that were utterly freezing and I know my character looked rugged up but I don't know uh, you know when you're still wearing jeans it, it, it's like you can wear the jacket because you still got to look cool I can't wear too much you know um too much under all that it was yeah it was freezing I don't know how much it helps so I, I like being comfortable but then you know hey you suffer for your art so it just comes with a job and and you know at the end of the end of the day I hate being bored if I had a job that wasn't keeping me on my toes and constantly like what is happening and I'm freezing and I'm here and there in, in this country and it's like today you're shooting underwater it's like I would be bored. I need that. So, you know, I kind of like the challenge at the same time. You know, we're all in it together. So it's kind of like you become very close when you're experiencing a, f a film shoot or a long TV shoot. You want, do you want to talk to the, the freezing conditions and the, um, the, re the realism of the shoot? Um, look, absolutely. I mean, I, I think uh, one of the things that was very clear even when you read this was that I mean, this feels like a trite thing to say, but Tasmania is sort of the star of the show. I mean, you knew that the landscapes and the places that we were going to be shooting this was going to bring so much to it. And I remember when I first got off uh, the plane, uh, I was driving into Hobart and you've got to go through all these uh, mountains. And there was this sort of low hanging fog on this mountain. And I remember looking at that and thinking, oh, that's the show. You know, this kind of mist and this fog that's sort of hanging low and you know, uh, obscuring the surface of things and, you know, blurring the line between what's real and imagined. And I kind of thought, right, if we can get that, that's going to be, that's going to be the show. Of course, when it came to shooting me arriving in Hobart, it was completely sunny day and they're kind of, you know, bring out the smoke machine. You're like, man, this was just here a week ago. <laughs> but, you know, Emma, Emma's right. Like I think shooting in those locations it brings so much to it. And sometimes you've kind of got these ideas about what you want to do and, you know, it'd be great if I can find a, you know, a moment of this. And then you get there and you're like, oh no, I'm actually just going to be dealing with the elements here. And Not dying. Something. Yeah, that, that's great as an actor because it sort of gets you out of your head and, you know, um, yeah, I mean, we shot in some beautiful places. And yeah, like Emma said early on, I mean, I'm in a big trench coat in the show early on. It was like, do I need this trench coat? Like, why am I why am I rugged up in the car? And then of course, by the end of the shoot, it was like, it became really clear. Just how, like when the snow got on the mountain, it was like, right, okay. <laughs> I ask you, um, uh, Michael Reimer directed the first two episodes. So in effect, he, he becomes something of a de facto set up director for this series. What, 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 um, as a director, uh, who has uh, certainly in the last couple of decades, predominantly worked in American television, what was your sense of what he gave to the gloaming that a purely Australian director might not have had? Is there something about working in the American paradigm that shapes a director's eye that you feel as detectable as, as performers? Do you have a sense of what makes his directing so specific? Um, not particularly. Um, he... Uh, he's a great director. I really, really like Michael. Um, but he's, you know, he's still Australian. Um, hang on, I'm like, is he? Yes, of course he is. <laughs> to question that for a second. Um, so, you know, he's done enough, enough of the uh, kind of Aussie stuff and he, he was fantastic at get, getting beautiful shots and, um, you know, I got along with him really well and um, it kind of... Uh, he sh he actually shot some of the, the killing, which is one of my favourite shows of all time, you know, and I really kind of like got that that vibe um, from him that, you know, he kind of had that, that kind of eye from it. It's kind of, uh, anyway, I can't really describe what I'm trying to say, but, um, you yeah, know, I don't think that he um, was too different from the other directors in the sense that it was like, well, you've done all this stuff in America, you're going to be completely different, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um at all um they all they all worked really well i think the directors they all had a really distinct style and something interesting and you unique to bring to it every single one of the directors um very different styles but again you know they had to dance with vicky and her vision and what she wanted and um you know because she's been working on this for a long time this is this is one of her babies after the kettering incident 
Um, and so everyone just kind of did their best to really just kind of work in with what she wanted whilst bringing their little kind of like um, their little touch, you mm. know, to the show. Um, yeah. You and you, you obviously then from Michael Rami, you, you know, Sean Davies is the second director, and then there's a third block of episodes by Greg McLean. As a, as an actor or as actors, both of you, how do you what what is the navigation between multiple directors? Some, you know, I know um, uh, with The Cry, for example, you and you worked with Glenn and Ivan, but he directed the entire piece. What what happens in the transitions between directors when, as an actor, you're working on a series? that is essentially broken up into, let's say, in this case, three blocks where each one will have a director kind of, you know, calling the shots. This, yeah, this was the first time in terms of something where I'd been one of the lead roles where I'd worked on a show that hadn't been... Well, Top of the Lake was two directors, actually, was Ariel Kleiman and uh, Jane. Um, but this, as you said, was uh, three directors. I mean, Michael I'd worked with before on something called uh, Deadline Gallipoli, when he told me in the audition for that, he said, you know, he said, look, they've got ideas of other people for this, but I'm going to go into bat for you. And I, I always remembered that he, he did that. And um, so I was really keen to work with him again. Look, I, I think because he'd done shows like The Killing, Hannibal, and then uh, Greg McLean had done the Wolf Creek films and other genre stuff. I mean, between... Uh, you're working with directors who have very clear... Um, uh, have a lot of experience of working in genre. So they're really good at sort of leaning into that and leaning into certain tropes, but then they're equally good at, at subverting them as, as well. And, you know, I, me I remember doing a scene with, um, walking into a scene that Greg was doing where we were in a crime scene and he kind of had the camera, you know, looking through the door frame and it was pulling back as Emma was sort of looking in there, looking at this sort of thing on the wall and they were dangling things from the roof. And, and I remember going, oh, I'm in seven. I know this scene, like I get this, I know this scene and I know the shot that he's doing right now. And that's really helpful a lot of the time. And, you know, I, th I think Sean, I was a big fan of Kettering Incident. And um, the second she read the pilot for this, she really wanted to be involved. And, and she also had episodes, especially for me, that sort of went off in places that I wasn't expecting. And, um, you know, you, you we're all trying to find it together and you're working with three people, as Emma was saying, who are also trying to find Vicky's uh, vision for it as well. And, um, you know, we, we, we also had three people who were very much in communication with each other. So we're all collaborating to, to kind of, you know, find this common, common vision for the show. But um, yeah, three wonderful, wonderful directors. I want to ask you, um, I'm going to give away um, my, my, I'm going to carbon date myself here by saying that many years ago in an interview, um, Heather Locklear um, said to me, the single most important person to her on a set was the lighting director because it, that, <laughs> she's like, that's make or break. That as an actor, how I'm lit matters. And no one, you know, yeah. the outside of that's not something that ever gets talked about. I want to ask you specifically here about Martin Dean, the cinematographer, um, uh, because I think to outsiders, you know, the press kind of filter everything through who wrote it, who directed it, who starred in it, and the conversation often peters out there. As actors, how important is a cinematographer and how, how key is a cinematographer in terms of how you are framed in the moment? And as a working actor in a scene on a live set, when you're moving around, is the most important thing that's going on in the moment the dance you're doing with the cinematographer, either that you're consciously leading or that the cinematographer is consciously leading? Um, yes. Yes. It's really funny you say that. You know, I've never, oh, this is, I've never really cared or thought about, I love it, the lighting director. That's so funny. Um, uh, prior to um, getting older, <laughs> I'm like, oh, could you, is that light working for me? I don't know. I don't know. It's funny. I'm, I'm a little bit like I don't care what I look like on screen, to be honest. I'm there to make art and to portray a character. And, but it's kind of separate to, uh, well, no, no, it's, it's kind of the same thing as well, but, um, you know, the director of photography. But it's like hey, they're, they're an artist. This is they, Their work is on screen. Um, they can make or break scenes. They can make, a, a, you know, a scene look completely epic and um, 
creepy and miserable and, and dark or like boom change the you know the lighting or the setup or anything and it, and it looks entirely different it doesn't have the same kind of um same kind of magic or force to it whatever so it's like they are what is seen at the end of the day do you know what I mean and so it's so important to have a a, a really phenomenal DOP um yeah I he is extraordinary I like really really brought so much to each scene just because he knew exactly what he kind of wanted how he wanted it um shot the tone of it um but then you look at these massive huge epic um shots uh, you know on the top of mountains some of the most crazily beautiful um parts of Tasmania I mean some of them actually looked like you're on a different planet I'm not joking you'd get up there and be like I don't feel like I'm on earth anymore you know and he's like I want all of that I want I'm going to go out and shoot all this they've, they've got this incredible fog that rolls through every now and again it's like this tunnel of fog that comes through Tasmania down the river and it's bizarre. Like it just happens even on sunny days and it's like, what is that? Like it's a thing. It's like, great, let's send out um, people to go film that. I'm going to film the moon these these days, the sunset here. We're going to go on top of the mountain. So we made sure he captured the, the full tone of the, you know, the whole of Tasmania and it's like how it looks is really just almost everything so it's very very important that they know what they're doing and they have a really really interesting vision it's, it's really important mm -hmm. you and do you want to talk to that yeah of course look i, I the, the two things that i'd done before this was um uh, the cry and then a show called safe harbor that were very much shot in a sort of uh i mean i had very quick schedules but it was shot in a sort of uh you know a sam chiplin who's an extraordinary dop but it was very much a sort of handheld let's just get what we get, grab it as we do. And it was very kind of perform like as long as we get the performances and, you know, it, it fed into the story to shoot it that way. Whereas something like the gloaming that is very genre and is trying to create a sense of mood. And, uh, you know, as Emma was saying, you know, it becomes a lot more deliberate the way it's shot. And you're aware when you're shooting it, that you're a part of a certain shot that's designed to evoke a certain thing. And, you know, I remember the first uh, film I did, was a film uh, back in 2004 called uh, Jew Boy. And I was the lead in it and I was very much, you know, I was very nervous and I was very much in my own, own thing. And I remember seeing the film for the first time and I had all this kind of anxiety and fear about how I was gonna come up in it. And the two things that I, my two big takeaways from watching it was that there was a whole bunch of work going on in regards to telling the story and enhancing my character's journey and performance that I hadn't even been thinking about. And that was the cinematography by a guy called Greg Frazier, who's now um, shooting some show called The Mandalorian and The Very Batman. Nice. And yeah. I think I used to be in his show reel. I think I've sort of been edged out over the years. I'm hoping to make it back in. Um, but you know, uh, the way that he'd shot it and what that was doing for me and as the film went along, it got more colourful as my character's world opened up. But also, I'm going to add to Heather Locklear's thing there and say the editor mm. is such a huge thing. Mm -hmm. And the more I watched it, the more I went, oh, this is a really well-edited performance because there's another version of this that might not be so good. And I've certainly done things, not to put blame elsewhere, where you've just gone, why are you on me right now? Like, I clearly don't know what I'm doing or, you know what I mean? Like, so... <laughs> uh, they're, they're the two the two big things for me is sort of cinematography yeah. and editing when it comes to uh storytelling and, and and they constantly say that you know the shooting you kind of you're gathering as much clay as possible and then you go into the edit room and you kind of have to put this thing together and um yeah they're they're the two big things that i've realized um are, are really important mm. Mm. Uh, finally just to to wrap it up um uh as performers, production is done, it's packaged and it kind of rolls out. I want to ask you about um, your relationship with the disciplines of film and television criticism. So the reviews of this were good. The Guardian said that it had shades of Twin Peaks. It gave you a four out of a possible 
five stars. Um, but I'm always reminded as a critic of a colleague of mine who, as a younger man, who was in a band, as all young men I suspect at some point might imagine they want to be, um, uh, can still to this day quote the worst review they got word for word. And I was really startled by how deeply that had damaged him. The question Are you going to ask us to read these things out? No, I'm not. I'm, not. I'm just going to ask as performers, as performers. Oh, I need to read it. As, a, as actors, what, what is your relationship with, with film and television criticism? Do you, do you read these things? Do they, do you, mm. is it more office ducks back? Do they hurt? I mean. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, interesting, interesting. Um, I used to read, I've been, look, I've been very fortunate with reviews. I, I've got to say, um, very hashtag blessed. Um, <laughs> Seriously, uh, of course, you know, I've seen the odd maybe not so nice thing written, but generally, um, you know, if it's someone working for a publication, mag uh, you know, a magazine, whatever, um, I've, I, I've got fairly good reviews. But then I've read, <laughs> then I've read just, you know, old Joe sitting at home and tapping away on his thing, blah, blah, fuck. And I'm like, wow, wow, or I get sent them. And I'm like, why are you sending me this? This is other actors from the, the show. I'm like, how about we just don't watch these anymore? And it's really funny. It's kind of like um, it doesn't actually affect me at all anymore because I'm like, there is, this is art. Art is not for everyone. Not everyone's going to like this um, vase I've got over there. Or the shade of it. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't mean you're terrible. It doesn't mean it was to the taste of that particular person. So you don't really believe the good things and you don't really believe the bad things. You just go, what am I doing here? What am I trying to create? What is the effect I'm trying to create? And just go out there and do your art. It's like, you know, you're never going to keep everyone happy. It's like what you post on Instagram. You're always going to get people commenting <laughs> crappy things on there sometimes and you just go, whatever. So... That's really the way I look at it now. It's like um, uh, it's nice when you read nice, you know, positive things, but I'm like, whatever. Do you know what I mean? If I really believe those and I really believe the bad stuff that's written. And so, um, yeah, it stopped affecting me. Once upon a time I was a bit like, you know, but back in the day I was like, oh, if I ever read something that wasn't so pleasant, I just don't care anymore. I'm here to make art. I'm here to tell stories. You can do what you want with it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Ewan? <laughs> is, it is, it is it dangerous to let? I mean, it's, it's the no, question. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. It's something I think a lot of the time actors and people don't really talk about. You know, it's that thing of, you know, some people, and, and it's true to a lot of people who go, I don't read reviews, but, or, you know, I don't care what people write. And then they get a bad one and you go, whoa, no, you care. <laughs> you care. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I've been uh, very fortunate and less fortunate. Um, I've done also, I mean, it's funny that you, you, you specify with the film and television uh, criticism because it's sort of done, you know, like the show's done, it's finished, but you can't change it. But at the same time, that's also stuff you can bring into the next job. And I've done a lot of theatre where, you know, you have the opening night and then you wake up and you read some reviews and maybe they're not great. Maybe they're really bad. And, <laughs> and you know, oh, wow, I've got to go do a matinee now. I mean, I've, been, I've read horrible reviews on my way to do a matinee. And look, my, my big thing with it is that I think with just about anything nowadays, especially with the internet, I mean if you would list one of my credits right now, I think within two minutes, I could bring up a review saying I'm great. Well, that sounds bad, but a, a positive review or a review that's really negative. Like you can't please everyone and everyone has a different taste. And the other thing is, um, I have my own feelings about my work. You know, something that I might get a really positive review for, deep down I'm going, yeah, and that's also not a big stretch for me. And I, I kind of, you know, it was sort of an easy role to play. And then something that I might get a negative review for is, is something that I might also be really, really proud of, you know, because it was a it was something that I hadn't done before and I was trying to trying new things. And um, 
It's funny. I mean, I've had experiences in the past where you just go, you know what, I'm not going to read any reviews. And then someone goes, hey, man, have you read, you know, have you read Michael's review in the SMH? And then you kind of go into that and read and go, oh, man, this is great. I wonder what else is out there. And then you kind of turn into, you know, a little piggy and get, uh, <laughs> and get really hurt by <laughs> someone else. So, you know, I mean, I, I think over the... I, I have periods where I read everything and then I have things where I go, I'm not going to read it. And then I end up reading it down the track. And, you know, I think there's also really good criticism and then there's damaging criticism. I mean, there's stuff that I, that has spoken about, say, the sound of my voice, you know, and that's something I can't change, you know, like things that you go, or the way you might look and you go, right, well, I can't change that. And that's not uh, constructive criticism. It's not helpful in any way. But, um, you know, at the same time, I've also had negative reviews that I've read at the end of runs of plays or other things that are down the track. I've sort of gone, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. And look, it wasn't my best work or didn't come together as much as I would have hoped. And But as Emma and I know from, the, the, you know, working on a whole bunch of stuff is, we're also aware of so many of the factors that come together to create these things. I mean, there's so many things that can go wrong that when you're in something that comes together and is really good, I mean, it's, it's almost a miracle that anything gets, gets made in the first place. And I think, um, you know, you, you're aware of so many of the factors and things that you were up against on the day and scenes that you go, wow, that scene came together really well because I know on the day we had not much time and only had one take between us and, yeah. So I guess my, my short answer is I have a complicated relationship with it, yeah. <laughs> let's, um, let's finish this with a, with a genre footnote. Um, this, I mean, this is presented as a, um, uh, a police procedural. It obviously has a lot of atmospheric elements around that. But one might also argue that this is a, a show that resides purely in the horror genre. Can, can you talk about it as, as actors? Do you, uh, how sort of, is a piece of work simply a piece of work or is something is, like, does genre exist in the mind of an actor finding a performance? Do you, do you, is it ever risky, for example, for you to say, this is a horror piece and I'm going to play it like it's a horror piece? Or do you have to come to it clean and with an open mind? Yeah, I think you you can never, you know, it's like, oh, I'm, yeah. You can't go in there and go, I'm doing a horror and then be like, ah, oh, play, you know, really play it like a horror. It's just the same every time until, unless you're doing, you know, the work of some great auteur, like, you know, you've got Tim Burton or, um, you know, uh, what, uh, Wes Anderson, do you know what I mean, which is very stylized and, it's kind of like you're watching a storybook um, in front of you. It's like if it's not that, you've got to go there, whatever the genre is, and just ground it in as much reality as you possibly can. It's like, you know, all comedy. I guess I do a little bit of comedy but not really. Um, yeah, that's kind, of, that's, that's kind of different as well. But like anything else, horror, it's like if you want it to be, terrifying then you ground it in as much reality as possible it's not like well i'm the scream um, queen i'm gonna go out there and, and be like i'm doing a horror but this is such a kind of this is so many genres rolled into one that's like but you know in saying that there was fear at the same time mm. um and i do mean that when it was like oh my god this is so many things rolled into one and i've got you know director's notes vicky's notes my own notes to myself and all these different genres and emotions going on, but I'm kind of like the, you know, this policewoman, this detective who's kind of like shut off but like feeling all this stuff but has to look like a policewoman and um, there's ghost staying there. So it was really like, oh, my gosh, how do I, how do I incorporate all of this and make people believe it? It was challenging. It was, it was challenging. But, you, yeah, we got there in the end, I think. Again, it depends. It does depend what happens in the editing room. That is a huge thing. You know, I've given some of what I feel is the best performances of my life and then gone and watched the movie and the scene's either cut out or it's completely hacked up and it's this entire different performance as well. And you're like, I didn't do that. 
on the day. So, you know, you, you put your life in the hands of the editor as well. But anyway, yeah, that's my answer. Mm-hmm. You and genre, how much does genre kind of sit in the mind of an actor? And specifically, you know, do you, do you see this as a horror piece rather than a, than a, than a, than a piece that sits in the, uh, sort of a more conventional crime genre? I guess it certainly has horror elements. I mean, uh, I guess the good, the good stuff, as I was saying before, like in terms of the ghost story aspect of it, then I've seen, for instance, where I'm haunted by this young girl, Jenny McGinty, where you're doing scenes where she's there as a ghost in the scene with me that I'm being haunted by. But at the same time, she's the girl that was killed in my past. So you kind of, even though you know you, right, I'm in sort of a horror scene now with a ghost, you can kind of go through it in a, in a sort of, well, what I'm really dealing with is, is the trauma of my youth and the grief of that and being haunted by that. So that was sort of the, you know, in terms of putting in an, into a, a reality that you could play as an actor, that was the, the way into that. I mean, you certainly, towards the end of the series, without giving too much away, that I certainly find myself in, I mean, I've got a big sort of, you know, do I say, yeah, I don't think I'm giving anything massive away. Scene where you're sort of like slowly going down a corridor, dark, dingy corridor as the camera's pulling back with you. And, you know, I've got Greg McLean going, bang, as you turn around to sort of scary noises that are going up. I mean, I'm very aware of what that scene is. Like, I know that this is sort of, you know, I mean, it's a kind of classic horror trope scene and it's meant to be scary. And But I can only play the absolute truth of that situation of how you might be feeling in that situation. I mean, fear is a really hard thing to play. It's actually a very tricky thing to play. So it's funny that like, when you do a whole bunch of those scenes in a row, it can kind of be a bit exhausting after a while as you're constantly trying to find new roads into it and ways that were kind of kind of working take one that aren't take three if you're lucky to get that. And um, so, yeah, you're sort of aware of it in, in the back of your mind, but... Um, you also can't think of it as well. But as, as Emma said in the editing, you're also, there's a huge amount of trust that you're sort of throwing yourself into it with a lot of trust, knowing that there's going to be a whole bunch of other work, sound editing, score, and all that stuff that's going to do a lot of the work for you as well. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Uh, we have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Um, uh, thank you for watching today. This uh, wraps the Foundation's Conversations at Home presentation for The Gloaming. Thank you, Emma Booth. Thank you, you and Leslie, and thank you to SAG AFTRA. Um, as a reminder, the SAG AFTRA Foundation COVID Relief Fund is there to support thousands of union performers who are going through tough times. If you're a SAG AFTRA member and need help, please ask. If you can help, please give. Um, information can be found in the description of the video. Thank you for your support. The Gloaming is streaming on Stars in the US and Canada. Thank you again and keep safe. Thank you, Bye. Michael. Bye. Thanks, Michael. Pleasure.